Hey there, I'm Matt. Thanks for clicking on this video that we make for people looking for purpose and understanding about their life and their faith. People just like you. And whether your connection to God feels far away right now, you just have some lingering questions about your faith, or you want to deepen your spirituality, my hope is that you'll find something here today that is helpful. We're in a series of videos right now that we call Unfollow. And nowadays with online content, it's really easy to unfollow or disengage when a person stops entertaining us or their views change from ours, or they just post things that we don't wanna see or hear. And unfortunately, we often treat our faith the exact same way stepping away when things start to get hard. But this mindset does not set us up for having a strong, growing faith. So we're gonna be looking at the circumstances that caused many people to turn away from Jesus in the last week of his life when everything seemed to be going pretty well. And what we'll see is that we often respond the exact same way, but through it, we can learn some lessons that can help us build a strong, steady faith that can handle the ups and downs that we face. Check this out. We're in the final week of Jesus's life before the death, burial, and resurrection. And he is famous all over Israel. People, thousands and thousands of people come to hear him teach and word spreads like wildfire. Everywhere he stops to do anything. Multitudes, the Bible says, are drawn to him. And in this last week, because he knows what's in the hearts of the people who are there, he begins thinning out the crowd a little bit. He rides into Jerusalem on a donkey and everybody shouts, Hosanna, Hosanna uh, to God. Uh, they're, they're actually quoting one of David's Psalms that indicate who the Messiah is, the one who's going to establish the throne of King David forever. And in the minds of the people, this means that Jesus is going to overthrow Rome. But he was less interested in the sin of Rome than he was in the sin that's in their hearts. And the truth is, you and I are still like this. I'm more interested in the sin around me than the sin that is within me. So in this final week of teachings, Jesus just cuts to the chase. There's not a lot of soft talk here. Like he's, homeboy is going in and people are dropping like flies. Uh, and it's becoming obvious that he is not interested in getting rid of Caesar. It's also becoming obvious that the people were less interested in what God wanted from them than they were in what they wanted from God. So Jesus spends these last few days seemingly unconcerned with the number of people who are gonna be offended or walk away, but more focused on exposing whether or not they were pretenders. And he's in Jerusalem teaching, and they're walking out of the temple where we pick up uh, the story today. If you've got your Bible, I want you to go to, to uh, Matthew chapter 24. And Jesus is on his way to Bethany, which is a little bit less than two miles away from Jerusalem. He's got to go out the eastern gate. He'll go into a valley, and he'll go up the other side where the Mount of Olives is. On the other side of the Mount of Olives, is Beth Bethany and his best friend Lazarus and Lazarus's two sisters, Mary and Martha, live there. They show up throughout the whole life of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books in the Christian New Testament, which all give the narrative of the life of Jesus from four different perspectives. Well, these people show up often and they're leaving Jerusalem to go down the hill, up the hill, to go over the hill, to spend the night where they'll then come back in the morning. Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. As Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. Like, hey, what about this? What about, and it's beautiful. Uh, now, Mark and Luke also give us um, this account as well. And they're pointing out to Jesus how beautiful the temple buildings are. But he, Jesus, responded in verse 2. Do you see all of these buildings? I tell you the truth that they will be completely demolished not one stone will be left on top of another. And then they just keep walking. Well, that shuts down the conversation uh, for at least a little bit because they leave, they go down the valley, they go up the other side, and nobody's talking about the buildings anymore. And one of the disciples is like, all right, I'll ask. It's probably Peter. He was the guy who seemed to be most verbally uh, proactive, is probably the nicest way to say it. 
And verse three, later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives and his disciples came to him privately. Now everything that happens next is private between Jesus and his disciples. So this is, everything I'm gonna say today is for those who would already identify as followers of Jesus, because that's who Jesus is talking to. Uh, his disciples came to him privately and they said, tell us when, when will all of this happen? Talking about when the temple is destroyed. What sign will signal your return? And what sign will signal the end of the world? So Jesus says something incredibly shocking that this temple, which has been here for over 400 years, is going to be knocked down and there won't be one stone left on top of another stone. Uh, and they don't know what to do with this. They followed up by asking three questions. One, when is the temple going to be destroyed? When are you coming back? And when is the end of the world? And the rest of this chapter is Jesus's three answers to those three questions. Again, the parallel passages are in Mark chapter 13 and Luke chapter 21. And you'll find by reading all three of these accounts that Jesus says that the temple is going to be destroyed before this generation passes away. They're going to see it in their lifetime. And then he says that the signs that will determine when he comes back, he says on that day, so he's talking about a much future period in time, and he said there will be wars and rumors of wars, nations will rise against nations. He said the culture, the prevailing culture in that day will be like it was in the days of Noah, where everyone will only be looking out for themselves and the, cultural, the culture will be identified by their sexual promiscuity. And of course, this doesn't sound familiar to us at all. But truthfully, there's been several different times in history where you could have described the culture in similar ways. Uh, before World War II, the pulpits in America were preaching about wars and rumors of wars, and in World War I, the Civil War and the Revolutionary War, I mean, truthfully, there's been many different times throughout history where the culture could have been defined in these ways, and today we find ourselves in another time in human history in which these things could also describe the culture in which we live. Then he says that the end of the world would come after the desecration in the temple by the son of perdition, which is another name for the Antichrist. Now, the Apostle Paul tells us more about the desecration of the temple in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'm going to read that before we get into the rest of the teaching. Here's what he says in verse 1. He says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them. Even if they claim to have had a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us. So he's warning against false teachers. Don't be fooled by what they say, for the day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness or perdition is revealed, the one who brings destruction. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God claiming that he himself is God. Now, Jesus never went into that much detail, but in all three accounts of Jesus' response to when will the end come, he says the son of perdition will bring that great desecration to the temple. And the apostle Paul tells us what the great desecration is, and that is that he will set up a throne in the temple of God and establish himself as God. Now, the book of Revelations talks about this. Daniel in the Hebrew scriptures talks about this a little bit also. Verse seven says, or excuse me, verse six says, and you know what is holding him back, for he can be revealed only when his time comes. Verse seven, for this lawlessness is already at work secretly and it will remain secret until the one, this is a person, who is holding it back steps out of the way and that's the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is at work, the Bible says, convicting mankind of his sin, drawing us toward faith and repentance. But there will be a day in history when Jesus pulls everybody to himself. He raptures the church. The Holy Spirit is removed, who is no longer holding back evil in the world. And then all of this stuff comes. So there's a few thoughts I want to point out from this. Today's teaching is not about the end times, 
but about the warning that Jesus gives in the meantime. The first thought is that this, the Bible says that sin will become more and more rampant as time goes on and we get closer to the return of Christ. Now, the first thing that Jesus happens already did happen, and that's the destruction of the temple. That happened in AD 70. That did happen before that generation passed away. He said, I will return when there will be wars and rumors of wars. There'll be famine, there'll be diseases, there'll be earthquakes. There's another verse, I believe it's in Mark, that says when crazy things start happening with the tides and with the seas, that's when he gathers people to himself. And then he says, that's not the end, but that will be the beginning of the end. Now, when the end comes, the Bible says the son of perdition or the Antichrist will establish himself as God in the temple in Jerusalem. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, that temple does not exist. So the end can't be now. So the one thing remaining before the Antichrist is revealed is that there'll be a temple built in Jerusalem. So that hasn't happened yet. Now, that could be built in short order if Jesus were to come back right now and gather his people to himself. And he goes on to say in those verses back in Matthew chapter 24 that we're not gonna read for the sake of time. He says, two people will be walking together, one will be taken away and the other one left. Two women will be grinding in the mill, one will be taken and the other one left. Woe to those who are pregnant in that time. Let the person who is on their rooftop not go back into their house to grab their coat. Let them run into the wilderness and hide because poop is about to hit the fan is essentially what Jesus says. So we as followers of Jesus can't be surprised when the world gets more and more rebellious against the laws of God. That's the first thing I want to point out. Number two is that they are going to build a temple where the old one was at some point. And that has to happen before the Antichrist reveals himself, which could be halfway through the tribulation, which means that if we're going deep today, if the rapture were to happen now, that temple would have to be built in the next three and a half years. Because, or the temple could be built before that happens. We don't know when the temple is going to be built. It's just that when the son of perdition desecrates the temple, it will be with himself sitting on a throne in the temple claiming to be God. Number three thing I want to point out is that there will be a great falling away of those who claim to be Christians. There will be a great unfollow and a great rebellion against God before Christ comes back. And then Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 24, again, we're not reading it for the sake of time, that the gospel will be preached to the whole world before the end so that no one has an excuse when they stand before God in judgment. All right, wow, that's, we just went deep right there. All right, take a mental commercial break, all right? Like, that's the answer to their three questions. They asked, when will the temple be destroyed? When will you come back? And when will be the end of the age? Jesus answers that question in chapter four. And in several other places, he hints at it. Daniel in the Hebrew Bible talks about it. The book of Revelation talks about it. We've had other sermons on this in the past. What I want to do is I want to tell you what Jesus spread throughout this teaching. And that was a warning against turning away from Jesus to follow after false messiahs, false teaching, or our idols. Even when the Apostle Paul talks about it, he says, don't listen to any, like even the Apostle Paul gives the warning against the great unfollow is what Jesus says will happen toward the end. Um, and while there's no one right now that I'm aware of who claims to be um, a false Messiah, there is a falling away. There is an unfollowing happening as, man, I heard about another famous YouTube preacher who's turning away from Jesus and is actually converted to Islam. I've got two different pastor friends of mine who are very solid, theologically conservative preachers of the gospel of Jesus who've now deconstructed their entire faith and are leading their congregation away from the historic teachings of scripture also. 
But for those of us who are Christians, this shouldn't be surprising. But if I'm going to be faithful to the witness of Christ, in his teaching during the last week, I also need to warn you against the things that will lead you astray also, because all of us have functional saviors. There are things that we go to instead of Jesus that become idols in our heart. And I think that you can quickly identify what these idols are by asking yourself what you won't give up to God. Because that's the thing you, most people who claim to be Christians would say that they love God. We just don't love God most. How can we tell? Because there's things that God has told us to stop doing that we won't stop doing. Because we love those things more than we love God. There are things God has told us to do that we still haven't done because we love those things more than we love God. And I think the big three is money, sex, and power. You want me to preach about anything other than money. So do I, because it's so uncomfortable. And today's sermon isn't about money. But I am presenting to you the false god of money. Uh, there's the idol of sexuality. We know what the Bible has to say about sexuality. Even churches now are leading people away from the biblical teaching around gender and sexuality. You can find a church now that will teach you anything that you want to believe. And the Bible said that that would happen too because in the later days, people would find preachers that scratch their itching ears. That's how, like the things that I want said, I'm gonna find a church that's gonna tell me that. That's what the Bible says. And then, and then power and pride. And here's what the Bible has to say about all three of those things. About money, Jesus said in the first sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, he said, no one can serve two masters for you will hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. And then he says, you can't serve both God and money, which is the reason why it's so important for us who are followers of Jesus to make sure that the first thing we do with our money every time we get paid is give to God first. And we do that here at Grace Church. Not everybody does it here at Grace Church. It's those ones that don't, that I'm talking to. Then if you're not a part of Grace Church, this has, you don't give to a church. I don't believe that you, it's not biblical to give to support the bills of a church. You give to worship and honor God through a church. In the Hebrew scriptures, you did that at the temple. In the New Testament, you did that through the local church. If this isn't your church, don't do that here. You should do it wherever you're a member, uh, whatever church that you are currently a member of. But the idea that a follower of Jesus would not put God first in their money is a danger to our hearts. It just is. We either serve God or we serve money. We can't serve them both. And you can tell which one you serve <laughs> by looking at your bank statement. About sex, God says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Sexual immorality is any type of sexual activity outside a marriage between a biological male and female. This is heterosexual, this is homosexual, this is pansexual, this is any type of sexual activity. Like the default setting for a Christian is abstinence. There's just only one outlet. And that's if you choose to enter into a covenant relationship for life with somebody of the opposite gender, of the opposite sex, biological. You have to do all these extra definitions now. And the third thing that he says is about power and money in James chapter 4, verse 6. But he gives even more grace to stand against such evil desires. As the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but favors the humble. I mean, the original sin back in the garden, according to Ezekiel, was when Satan said, I want God's chair. And that pride is the reason why he was cast out of heaven down to the earth where he now roams like a lion seeking whom he may devour, roaming to and fro, seeking whom he may devour, the Bible says in two different places. And even Adam and Eve's original sin was, I want more. I want to be like God, knowing good and evil. God's holding back on me. 
I want more for myself. It's that power which comes from, that's just the outlet for the pursuit of pride. So God says these are the things, these are the idols, these are the false messiahs, the false rescuers, the functional saviors that pull people who claim to be Christians away from God. Again, if you're not a follower of Jesus, this teaching isn't for you today. This is for those of us who would identify as followers of Jesus. And Jesus says, the thing I want you to know the most is that the farther we get from the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and the closer we get to the return of Christ and the end of this age, the more people are going to unfollow Jesus. The more we're going to start looking to our functional saviors and less to Jesus. So Jesus and the Apostle Paul warn us, be on guard for this, all right? Then how should we live? And that's Matthew 25. Jesus gives us three stories to just the disciples. Remember, this is a private conversation with these 12 guys who had identified themselves as followers of Jesus for life. And one of them was a liar, that was Judas. So remember, Judas, who betrays Jesus, who right now is not in the presence of God, but is in hell, is still listening to this. So he's definitely an unfollow. And truthfully, on the night that Jesus was betrayed in the garden, all of the disciples, the Bible said, abandoned Jesus and ran off in the night. So all of them end up unfollowing. So then Jesus says, these are the three stories I want you to remember. The first is about 10 bridesmaids. I'm going to read that story, and I'm going to tell you the other two stories. So in, in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 25, here's the first story, verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be, this is a future, right? So this is like, guys, from now until I come back, this is what it's going to look like. The kingdom of heaven will be like 10 bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take extra olive oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and they fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused back by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids get up, and uh, uh, all the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned after having bought their oil, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door to us. But he called back, Believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. Then he says, the second story, the kingdom of heaven is like a master who has three servants and he goes to a faraway place, the faraway place and the master is heaven and this is Jesus and the three servants are the followers of Jesus. And he gives to one five bags of silver, to one two bags of silver, and to one one bag of silver. Jesus makes the distinction of saying that each one of them were given exactly what they could handle and not a piece of silver more or a piece of silver less. less. And then they are responsible for what they've been given, and he will come back at a later date, but he doesn't tell them when. The five goes out and invests, and he risks, and he leverages. And when the master comes back, he's been able to turn the five into ten. The two went out and did the exact same thing, and he was able to leverage the two. And by the time the master came back, he'd gone from two to four. And then the one, out of fear of losing what he had, went and buried it so that when the master come back, he could say, well, at least I'm giving you back what you gave me. When the master comes back, Jesus says, he'll say to the first one, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over little. You'll be faithful over much. Enter the joy of your reward. To the second servant, he says, you were faithful over little. Now you'll be faithful over much. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your reward. But to the guy who buried it and only gave back what he had been given, didn't leverage it, didn't put it at risk, didn't use it wisely. What was given to him is taken from him, given to the guy who had 10. And then he's cast out. Then it goes straight into the third story. And the third story is the final judgment day. 
And on the judgment day, God gathers all the people together and he separates them as sheep from goats. To the goats he puts on the left hand, to the sheep he puts on the right hand. And to the goats he says, be cast out into outer darkness. Why? We believed in you. And he will say, because I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. I was in prison, you didn't visit me. And I was sick and you didn't care for me. When do we not do these things? When you did not do it for the least of these, my brethren, you were not doing it for me. And they are rejected. Then he says to these on the right, he says, hey, you, when I was sick, uh, you visited me. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. And when I was in prison, you cared for me. When did we do all of those things? And he said, when you did it for the least of these, my brethren, you did it for me. Enter into the joy of your reward. And that's the three stories that he tells them. And here's the three lessons from the three stories. Time is short. And like the bridesmaids, you don't know when the bridegroom is coming. You don't know when Jesus is going to return. You don't even know. You don't even know when your last day gets here. None of us do. There's another passage of scripture. The Bible says that our life is like a vapor. It's here for a moment and then it's gone. The scariest thing to me about death is not that it's going to happen. It's that I don't know that it's going to happen. But then I ask myself, would I want to know? And I don't think I'd want to know either, but I kind of want to know how much time I have left without knowing when it's going to happen. Because I think if I knew when it was going to happen, I'd be filled with anxiety. So maybe it's a blessing. I don't know. But either way, Jesus says, time is short. Always be ready. Always be ready. That's the message of the bridesmaids. Time is short. Don't waste it on things that don't matter. In the parable of the master with the three servants, they were each given different things. And none of them complained about what they had given. And each one of them had a choice on what they did with what they were, had been given. The first two leveraged everything that they'd been given in the interest of their master with risk, with intelligence, with hard work, with focus. They were able to double what had been given to them to present back to the master. And he said, you were faithful over little. Even the five said, you were faithful over little. Now I'm going to give you so much more. Here's what's awesome. Is that the reward for the two bags of silver guy was the exact same as the rewards of the five bags of silver guy. Because the point of the story is not what they had been given, but what they did with what they had been given. Whereas you and I are constantly distracted by the amount of what we've been given. I say, I need more, or I'm thankful that I don't have less, or I need more, or I'm, or I'm unhappy with where I'm at because I see other people that have something different. That's the distraction of the first story. That's the functional savior, that's the idol, that's the thing that will cause me to unfollow and to waste the life that I've got. You and I both have been given all that we need, everything that we need, in order to live fully as devoted followers of Jesus who live lives of significance, lives that matter for the kingdom of God. But then the one who has one, he could only handle one, by the way, he was ruled by fear of losing what he had, and it was his fear of losing what he had that caused him to unfollow. It was, it was fear, right? So with the first, it was laziness. For the second, it's fear. And then in the third story, it's, I don't know, pride, it's selfishness. Because he says the ones that stay following me are the ones that recognize that all that they have is to be leveraged for everybody who doesn't have. And who's that? The least of these. The least of these. That we are to constantly love like Jesus loved, to give like Jesus gave, to serve like Jesus served, which is counterintuitive to our culture, which says you make sure you get everything you can for who? For us. That's what we do this for. And I think there's four different things that we can do with today's teaching. And each one of these things is going to be the answer to one of four questions. The first question is this. What's the idol that pulls you away from full obedience to the Lord? Is it money? 
is it your sexual identity, your sexuality, your sexual expression? Is it pride? Is it what other people think about you? Is it your reputation, your status, right? Like what's the thing that you love more than God that you won't be open-handed with? Because that is the thing that is right now causing you to unfollow. Like what would Jesus say to you right now? Like if he was talking to you personally and you're right now thinking of the one thing that you won't fully surrender to God, what would he say that that's doing to your relationship with him? And then what do you think he would ask you to do next? All right, do that. Second question, if you somehow were going to know, supernaturally somehow Jesus said he, he even didn't know when he was going to come back. Because like in a Jewish wedding, the groom doesn't know when the wedding starts, his father does. And so the father says to the son, go claim your bride. And that's how he knows when the wedding day is. Jesus, the same way, said, no man knows, not even the son of man knows the day or the hour when it happens. But if you were to somehow know that your life was going to end Wednesday, or Jesus was returning on Wednesday, and you better clean house, what would you do differently with the next three days, the next four days? Because maybe that's what you ought to do anyway. Third question, what has God given you? What finances do you have available? What resources do you have at your disposal? What connections has God given you? What skill sets, abilities, temperament, and personality do you have? That's your bag of silver. How are you right now leveraging each area of your life for the kingdom of God? If you're a dad, how are you leveraging your family for the kingdom of God? How are you doing in showing your children that the kingdom of God is more important than their success at school or in sports? What priority do you give the body of Christ and working together with the other believers in this church family to accomplish the mission of God? Like that's, that's just, I'm saying that as a dad who has kids. In your marriage, how are you modeling godliness for your wife? Like that's part of your, in your singleness, how are you leveraging the available time that you have, right? For the kingdom of God to make a difference in the lives of other people. And what could you be doing differently with the different bags of silver that God has given you in these different areas of your life? And the fourth question is this, who are the least of these in your life? And would they say they feel loved by you or not? Because this is how we ought to be occupying our time until the end of our time or until Jesus comes back to get all of us. I don't know what needs to change. I'm hoping God pointed something out to you because that's what you need to work on right now. Because we genuinely don't know how much time we have left. So don't waste any of it. Let's pray. God, I love you with all of my heart, and I'm thankful uh, for teachings like this that force me to evaluate the more private areas of my life that are less known to more people, and maybe more mo known to only a few. I pray that I would be a godly example in every area of my life, that I would be fully leveraged for your kingdom purposes, that I would... Be careful of the idols in my heart, the things, the addictions to sin, the pride, the finances that I honestly trust in more than you sometimes. Uh, lust, the way that my marriage is, my sing our singleness is. God, on our view of ourself and our role in the world, change these things for us. Help us to live recognizing the urgency of life and how short uh, time is. Help us to consider how every area of our life could be leveraged more meaningfully for your kingdom purposes and for the good of others. And help us to be aware of how other people are doing around us, even those that we consider to be less than, especially them. 
God, it's easy to do good things for people that can help us. We'll put them on our debt so that they can help us someday. God, there are those in our life that we've considered to be not worth the effort, not worth the time. Break our heart over them. Dear God, please, because you did that for us, we should do that for others. This is our prayer. We ask this in Jesus' name, and we all say together, amen. Hey, well, I really do hope that you found this teaching valuable wherever you're currently at in your spiritual journey. And as we're unpacking this series and identifying reasons that people disengage from faith, my hope really is that it'll just bring some clarity as to how committed our faith really is and reveal the times we allow faith to take a back burner seat so that in those moments, we can make a conscious decision to lean into our faith, even if it does push the level of our comfort. And if our team can serve you in any way, whether that's through prayer, encouragement, or helping guide you through some questions that you're wrestling with, we are here for you. Feel free to reach out to us using the info that's on your screen right now. Or if you'd like some resources to build spiritual disciplines in your life, we have options like a Bible reading plan that our church currently follows every single week. And you can join simply by texting the word Bible to the number that is on your screen. And it can help you establish a daily rhythm of engaging with God through the Bible. Just let us know if there's any way that we can assist you as you grow in your faith. That wraps everything up for today. We'll see you again next week.